What does it even mean exactly to be made into the image of God? An unbiblical view of what it means to be human dramatically changes everything else that we believe about humanity, about interacting with other people, about what makes us special and unique, about how to relate to God. All these things are dramatically affected. What created us? Everything. Today we're going to dive in in greater detail and you're going to learn exactly what it means to be made in the image of God and how that affects how we interact with other people and how we uh, approach other belief systems and what they teach about what it means to be spiritual and what it means to be human. So let's dive in. What's up Empower Christians? Glad to be back with you again. I pray the Lord is blessing you and moving in your life in big ways and using you for the kingdom of God. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We're, I'm so glad to have you with us. I'm Pastor Brian with Empowered Christian Ministries. And throughout this entire series, we're going through my book, The Empowered Christian Roadmap. And these videos are a companion that goes along the book with you. So this way, if you never get the book, you can at least get all of the main points from the book. And if you do have the book and you're going through it, then you can also watch these as a supplement to remind you of the main points and to just make sure that you're really grasping everything and you have a quick resource that you can get online later. I encourage you to go and download the free reading plan on our website and there's a bunch of different curriculums based on how much you want to read and how fast you want to read and how often your small group meets. Hopefully you're in a small group and I uh, hope that you will consider uh, using the book as part of a Bible study curriculum because it's perfectly tailored to cover many, 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 many topics and I think it will bless you and the rest of your friends and family that study with you. Click the links in the description. All right, so let's just dive in. This section is a big one. It is 10 pages long, this one section. So I'm obviously not going to be able to cover the whole thing in this one video, at least not in significant detail. So what I want to do is for two or three minutes, give you all the major bullet points just so you can, okay, what's the main thing that this section is teaching? And then I'll spend a little bit of time uh, going through some of the more important lessons for those of you who don't have the book yet, who can't read it on your own. So, and I want to make sure that you guys are learning this material and it's affecting your life and affecting your walk and affecting you and helping you become a disciple of Jesus, even if you don't get the book. So the main point is this, an unbiblical understanding of what it means to be human leads to all kinds of false beliefs. I begin this section just outlining a bunch of the ideas that other religions uh, teach and say, okay, it's not any of that stuff, all right? We're not, we're not a soul trapped in a body. We're not, you know, part of the universe. We're not uh, evolved creatures. Evolution is false. Um, what exactly it means to be a Christian affects uh, what happens when we become born again as a Christian. It affects when a person is demonized or possessed or any of these terms that we use and what exactly that might look and how that might work. Uh, what Jesus... Um, when he lived on the earth, how his human nature was affected, uh, what it means when he was resurrected, what changed, what, ch what will change when we become resurrected, uh, how were we created, what exactly did God mean when he said that we're made in his image and likeness, and what exactly is broken within us as a result of sin, original sin, and what we have to deal with right now that's often called the flesh. The primary creation uh, teaching is from Genesis 1 and 2. I go through the creation and all these different things in great detail, but the main takeaway is this, that I argue for. Human beings are made in the image of God. We are tripartite, which means three parts, body, soul, 
and spirit. The body is a, a physical, you know, carbon-based uh, life form similar to all of the other animals and things on the earth. That is not the part of us most like God. Um, however, we do have a brain and the ability to think and process information and reason, and that part is. The soul is the seat of our identity. It is who we are. We don't have a soul. We are a soul. Okay? We are a soul. A soul is us. It is our identity. It is our mind, our will, our emotions, our memories, our desires. It is the essence of who we are. And then lastly is the spirit. The spirit is the part of us that gives us our conscience, which is the essentially the law of God imprinted upon our hearts. It is the part of us that allows us to commune with spiritual beings and with God directly. How we can have a spiritual connection and relationship is because we have a spirit. That's how we can, we can connect with spiritual beings like angels or demons as well as to God. The soul and the spirit are inseparable. They're connected. The, if you, you don't have a soul unless you also have a spirit because the spirit is the part of us that gives life but they are distinct just as when we looked at the holy trinity and they are distinct but not separate the soul and the spirit are distinct but not separate if you cease to have life if you cease to have a spirit then you cease to essentially have a soul however the spirit and soul can live on without the body which is what exactly happens when our body dies and our spirit and soul goes to be with the Lord for those of us who belong to the Lord. And now that we know that, what it means to be made in the image of God is that we have a separate identity, a soul. We are a soul. We have a unique identity. Um, we have a mind, will, and emotions and reason and a spirit and the part of us most like God is our spiritual nature you know John uh, 4 24 says that Jesus said God is spirit right and so the part of us most like God is the spiritual part of us because human beings are made in the image of God we have intrinsic value we have value that is internal it's just a part of we have worth just because this means it doesn't matter race doesn't matter nationality doesn't matter ethnicity doesn't matter sex or gender doesn't matter you know it level of intelligence or physical ability or disability none of these things matter as far as the amount of value we have just for being a human we have value because being a human we're created in the image of god and that truth should affect everything else it should affect how you treat other people it should affect how you see other people it should affect how you uh, vote when it comes to things like abortion, right? That is a, a child made in the image of God in someone's womb. And it is still a soul and a spirit, even if the body is not yet fully formed. Okay, so now let's dive into this a little bit more deeply. So the first, uh, we understand creation from Genesis 1. And there, there's a bunch of different views on this, and I'm not going to get completely into it. I give you my perspective in the book, and it is basically this. Genesis 1.1 says God created the heavens and the earth. I understand this to mean the entire universe. 
this happens at an undisclosed time, I'm perfectly fine with that being 13.7 billion years ago. After Genesis 1.1, the camera zooms in from the vantage point of the surface of the earth and verses 2 through 31 describe different events happening from the surface of the earth. Uh, some interpret these as literal 24-hour days. Um, these, these progressive stages of creation called yams, often translated days. Some interpret these as literal 24-hour periods. Some as long but finite periods of time. I'm fine with either way. I tend to lean towards the latter, but both are fine and biblical. The primary verse text is Genesis 1, 26 and 27, where it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, and over all the earth itself and every creature that crawls upon it. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. In the following chapter, we see a summary and a greater detail of the thing that was described in Genesis 1. So I've heard people say that this is two separate creation accounts. It's completely false. In Genesis 2-4, it says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made them. Right. So this is just retelling in greater detail the same thing we just read from Genesis 1, 26 and 27. This is telling us how God did it when he did it then. Continuing on, verse 7, Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. Then I jump down to verse 21, right before he makes Eve. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he slept, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the area with flesh. And from the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her to him. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for out of man she was taken. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. So did God only make man in his image, and then he just made woman from man? No. The, when God says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that he made them, he made man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. So when it says man here, it doesn't mean male. It means human. Human. He created human in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Right? So if you encounter cults and stuff who say that only man is created in the image of God and women aren't, that would be completely unbiblical and false and completely reject that nonsense. So how exactly are we made in God's image? We know that God doesn't have a body. Now he can appear in a physical form that's called a theophany and it happens throughout the Bible. He can um, present himself with physical form. He also, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, took on human flesh, actually became a man. But we know that the essence of God is invisible, has no limit, imitations, <clears throat> is spirit, is invisible. He existed prior to a physical creation, and he is over all and through all and in all. So God transcends physical appearance. We know that the body is not the way that we're made in the image of God. You don't have a soul, you are a soul. The word soul comes from the Hebrew word nefesh, and it's used multiple times in Genesis 1. There are, there are animals who essentially are soulish animals, right? We can compare when we look at 
a dog, for instance, and, and see the difference between a dog and a cockroach, right? There's one has emotion and desire and feeling and empathy. They can form relationships. There's, there's, a, there's a, they're much more complex. And this doesn't necessarily mean that they have a spirit, right? There's a difference, but they're soulish. They have an individual identity to them. We have that as well. In the book, I do document for a couple of pages this idea of either being two-part or three-part and the duopartite view versus the tripartite view. Um, the duopartite view is that humans are body, flesh, and then soul and spirit as one combined or united uh, type of entity. And the tripartite view, which is that the body, the soul, and the flesh are all distinct. And the main takeaway between the two is that either is biblical and fine, but I personally believe in the tripartite view, and I think, I, and I argue in, in the book, multiple reasons why the soul and the spirit are different and how that affects everything else later on when we start getting into other types of doctrines. Um, but at the end of the day, as long as you believe that human beings are both material and immaterial, then you'll be okay. I did create this little uh, graphic here, and as far as I know, I'm the first, I, the Lord kind of just inspired me with it, so if anybody else has something similar, I, you know, great, but I didn't learn it from anybody, it kind of just came up with it. And I took the Trinity diagram, and, and obviously I'm not trying to create a direct parallel, I'm just showing the similarities. The fact that we're human, and the, the distinction between these. And they're all interconnected. They're all part of being human, right? We are spirit, soul, and body. The chief passage of this view comes from 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where it reads, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, like purify you completely. And may your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here in this passage, dedicated to specifically talking about the parts of us that can be sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and Paul lists all three parts, three separate words, halakloron, completely, our pneuma, spirit, psyche, soul, and soma, body. And the main way to think about this is when we become born again, born of the Holy Spirit, we don't stop being an individual soul, right? We don't go, we don't get a new spirit and then are now a new soul where we don't have our old mind, will, emotions, memories, desires, feelings, values, etc. We maintain all of that distinctness of who we are as a person, yet we now have a new spirit. That's what the scripture teaches. We don't stop being that old person completely. Now we know that the Holy Spirit comes in and he begins to change and shape and mold that old person, that, that former soul now starts to become sanctified, as does the body, which is now put into submission by the spirit as well. But these things don't, they don't change overnight. They don't become brand new. It's part of the process. So I've, obviously, if we don't make that distinction, then we won't recognize it and we won't be empowered to have the same level of influence uh, and understanding. If I think I'm supposed to be a completely brand new person and I'm still struggling with my old stuff, then I'm gonna doubt my own salvation, I'm gonna doubt why I'm struggling with this stuff, I'm not gonna understand it properly. 
and it's going to affect my life and my behavior and my actions and my how I feel, all my emotions are going to be wrapped up around it. No, all those things are part of the soul. And when we become born again, we become a new spirit. Our spirit is given new life. And if we understand this and understand that the spirit now has access to our soul, then we can learn to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to pervade and invade the rest of our soul and begin to influence and take over and transform and sanctify the soul. So instead of thinking, I must not be saved, I'm broken, it's the flesh, it must be the body, we can know I have the spirit, I need to learn to make the body and the soul submit to the will of the spirit. Okay. Just wrapping your head around that and beginning to allow that to influence how you think and feel in the future will dramatically empower your ability to become holy. Your ability to actually be a disciple of Jesus who follows the commandments, who is led by the Spirit. You're going to become much better uh, able to, to become a conqueror and victorious over all of the sins of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and, and the pride of life and the lust of the eyes and all this stuff. So the reason people don't get past a lot of that and they stay in their sins for years and years or decades is because they're empowering their sin. In the same way, they're empowering their sin by blaming everything on the flesh. Many people blame the flesh on everything. Now we do know that the flesh is sinful. I'm not going to deny that. We, we're going to get way into that later. But the flesh isn't just the body. Like the body's evil and the spirit and soul are good. No. All three parts are dead and dying because of sin. Right? The body, the flesh, is dying and dead because of sin and it will continuously want and crave sinful things. The spirit was dead and dying, but now it's born again and has new life. And the soul was dead and dying, and now it has access to the source of life from the spirit. So the spirit can begin to change your soul. That's you start having the mind of Christ. You start being led by godly desires. Just as, as a quick interjection, we'll cover in much greater detail later on. Um, when it comes to being spiritually dead, it does not mean we're not able to do anything. So, I know there's some people who are not going to like that, but that's the truth. The truth is, we can do something about it. Just because you struggle with sin and you're in the sinful flesh and you're dead in your sins and trespasses, does not mean you cannot do anything about it. We have been empowered to do something about it and we can be victorious. And those of us who put our trust in the spirit and allow him to lead us, we not only can, we will be victorious. Change how you think and it will affect how you feel and how you feel will change how you behave and how you behave will affect who you become. Okay? And we'll if you want to learn more about that, we get all into it in chapter 4. But for right now, just know that you can do something about your sinful flesh. It is not a, a chain around your ankle dragging you down throughout your whole life. You can overcome it. Uh, pastors are condemning the flesh and making it only evil. And, and yet, they don't even talk about demons. <laughs> They don't talk about spiritual things like curses or cursed objects or witchcraft or spiritual oppression or emotional bondage. They don't talk about any of this kind of stuff because it's a downer, right? You just want to make everybody feel good, tell everyone it's okay. Or they go the other direction and they just demonize the flesh. The flesh, the flesh, the flesh, the flesh is the reason you have all these problems. It's always the flesh. They're demonizing the flesh instead of demonizing the demons. <laughs> right? We live in a spiritual reality. We have a spiritual enemy. 
we're in a spiritual war. We need to understand these things, believe in these things, trust in what the scripture actually tells us about these things, and then fight these things with spiritual weapons. And you can't fight your flesh. It's your flesh. It's the body that you're going to have the rest of your life. <laughs> you, it, your body isn't your enemy. Not your main enemy, anyway. There is, it is sinful. I, I acknowledge that before. And it, we, as Romans 6 describes, we do have to wage war against the sinful flesh. But it's a war that we can win. <laughs> what we need to also do is realize that we have a spiritual enemy and there's a lot of things that could be caused by demonic powers. A lot of, you know, besetting sins, sins that we just have not been able to get past, addictions, you know, all kinds of stuff and emotional problems and sinful vices and we're blaming it we're calling it the flesh and saying it's the flesh that's why i can't get past it and i'll always have the flesh therefore i'll always have this problem that is disempowering people to keep themselves stuck in that problem so you have to know the flesh, the things we're waging war against in the flesh. And again, we're going to get way more into this later. I just, I want to plant this seed in you guys now. You don't have to keep all of that sin in your life. It's, you have the Holy Spirit in you and he is empowering you to overcome all this stuff. The things that you wage war in the flesh are like, lust, the desire to crave things that are sinful. Jesus showed us that you can have a desire, you can be tempted by sin because of flesh. You can be tempted by it and then you can reject the temptation and do what is good and right. And godly and so glorify God with your behavior so that's the waging of the war you're gonna keep having this temptation and you have to keep resisting it and keep being led by the Spirit because those you know as Romans also describes those of us who are being led by the Spirit do not give any way to the flesh right we're, we're being led by the Spirit, not by those desires of the flesh. So we have to realize that if we're already doing that and we're having some other kind of problem, it might be a spiritual problem and we might need, we might be dealing with demonic oppression or other things and then we need to fight against those with spiritual weapons, with prayer and, and you know, and other things that you'll learn later on. A lot of this is, uh, Satan is empowered when we believe his lies, as we looked at in the last section. But we're set free by truth. The truth will set you free. So I'm taking the time to teach you guys these things so that you'll understand truth. And as you understand truth, it will empower you. If you keep empowering these disempowering beliefs, if you keep trusting in those things, you'll keep staying in bondage to them. But you can overcome them. And it begins with just believing the truth. So, receive it. So, one last quick note is we do have to learn to make the body submit to the will of the Spirit. And so this, as we're doing that, we need to also stop looking at the body as the enemy. The body is just a tool. It's, a, it's the vessel we're encased in. The, the flesh, in one sense, is good. Jesus came in the flesh. He wouldn't have if flesh was evil. We wouldn't be resurrected and get bodies again later if flesh was evil. We will have a new earth one day and new bodies one day. Flesh was part of the good creation that God said in Genesis 1 
it is good. It is very good. So the flesh is good. We need to value our body. We need to steward it well. We need to take care of it. You need to take care of your health. You need to take care of your mind and your emotions and all of that stuff. You need to steward it well for the glory of God. So don't neglect your body thinking it doesn't matter. And all I have to do is worry about my spirit and my soul. The body needs to be put in submission and it needs to be used for God's glory. God has given you gifts and talents and abilities, natural abilities that he's given you uniquely so that you can use those things to glorify him. Those are parts of your body. If he gave you great intelligence, that's part of your body. Value it. If he gave you musical talent or athletic talent or whatever, use it value it, you know, esteem it, be, see that as a gift from God and take care of it and take care of, steward the whole thing. Don't, you know, stay in good physical shape and then work a hundred hours a week and stress yourself out and, and not take care of your body that way. Make sure you're getting sleep. Make sure you're taking care of your body. Don't, you know, get addicted to alcohol or cigarettes or, any of these other kind of unhealthy, you know, or drugs or any of these other kind of unhealthy things, because then you're abusing the very thing that scripture tells us is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So take care of your body. Don't see it as your enemy. See it as something that has the potential to lead you into sin, but also has the potential to be used for great glory for the Lord and use it that way. That is what it means when scripture tells us that we are a living sacrifice. So let, so every day when you kill the sinful part of your flesh and then you use the rest of you, all of you, to glorify the Lord, you are becoming and live, being a living sacrifice to the Lord, which is more glorious than a temporary sacrifice. So the last section is the spirit. And this is, like I said before, is the, is the most important part of us. It's the part of us that everything else has to rely on, right? Our, we need our spiritual nature. It's the part of us most like God. And it's the part of us that is born again. And that happens first. So it's, it's the part of us that that uh, has to guide everything else. And even prior to being born again, the spirit part of us is where God's law is impressed upon us. It's where the human conscience is, right? And Romans 1 describes how every person, even unsaved people who do not know God or love truth, all have a conscience. And the conscience is the law of God imprinted upon the heart of every single human. Now, it's not, it's, it's not perfect access to God because it has also been corrupted by sin. But it's there. It's there. And we have the ability to be led by that conscience or to allow our own wicked desires to sear the conscience. And so, but everyone has a conscience and that is part of our spiritual nature, right? You can't, you can't put it in a, in a measuring cup and measure it. A conscience is a spiritual thing and it does not, it's not our own. It comes from God. That's why it convicts us of our sin, right? The conscience is, is the spiritual, is part of the spiritual part of us that God gave every human being so that none of us has an excuse. And on Judgment Day, our consciences will convict us or exonerate us. So, every human being has that. Even those who are dead in their sins. Okay? So, you can appeal to the conscience of unsaved people and try to um, teach them about their sin and hoping that the Holy Spirit will assist in that process and convict them of their sins and draw them to repentance and to trusting in Jesus for 
eternal life. But it's the conscience there that, that can help steer people towards repentance in the first place. One last thing um, about the soul. This is the realm where, uh, where demonic influence can affect us, right? Um, it, this is true for Christians as well. If this is, it's it, the two part view is a lot of the reason why um, people don't believe that Christians can be tormented or oppressed by demons. Because if your soul and your spirit are one thing and you're born again, then there's no room left. There's no room left for a demon to influence or to come in. But in the tripartite view, you're born again and it's your spirit and your soul could still have a lot of the junk and garbage in it from before, from before you were born again. And it could have lots of bad habits and addictions and all kinds of things. We're going to get into that later. I have an entire chapter three that talks all about the junk that could come in and what to do about it. But the, the main takeaway right now is to know that if a person is demonized, it doesn't mean, you know, you can't be possessed by Satan and by the Holy Spirit at the same time. You're only owned by one. Once you're born again, you're owned by the Lord and you belong to Him. Okay? So even if you're dealing with demons, and, and a lot of people find me who, who are, who, who love the Lord and who are devoutly trying to follow Him, right? So it does not mean you're not saved if you're dealing with demons and demonic oppression. All it means is that you could be born again, born of the Holy Spirit, and yet your soul could be demonized and oppressed. And it means there's demonic influence and access in your soul, affecting your mind, your will, and your emotions, right? Your memories and these other things, your desires. So again, re see these compartments and realize that if you have access to the Holy Spirit, He's right there. He's right there. As long as your faith is in Jesus and the gospel, the Holy Spirit is right there in you. And you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, say a prayer because God's way out there, way up in heaven, far away. And you got to somehow get him to come help you. And you don't have to go and find the, the deliverance ministers and say, I need you because you've got some special power that, or anointing or gifting to, to make this thing leave, right? The Holy Spirit's right there. So before you even go out externally and try to get help, and that's okay, there's a time for that. We're, we're here to help minister to one another's needs and to be here for one another. And God has gifted and empowered and helped raise up and train people that are more skilled in different disciplines needed within the body. But you need to realize that the Holy Spirit's within you and you, you want that, you want to start accessing Him directly. And so that way you're applying the pressure against these spiritual demonic forces from within, from within directly. And that will make a huge difference in your victory because you're not putting your faith in external things. You're putting your faith in the Holy Spirit within you, which is an essential part of the actual gospel, right? So it's faith derived in the gospel and in your right relationship with God through Christ and the Holy Spirit in you that is the starting point for you to begin fighting for that victory. So that's what it means to be made in the image of God. And that's a understanding of of what it means to be body, soul, and spirit. The spirit is the part of us most like God, the part of us most in his image. Although there's aspects of our physical intelligence that are similar to God, we're able to rule over creation and, and the created order, and that's an aspect of God, um, as well as our soulish 
attributes, mind, will, emotions, the ability to have love, the ability to have relationship. Those are also aspects of what it means to be made in God's image. So all these pieces all play a role, but the spiritual part of us is the part of us most like God. And every human being has these attributes. And then we become born again by putting our faith in Jesus. We elevate that even more. And now we're not just in the image of God, we're becoming like the image of Christ. Because the Holy Spirit is beginning to discipline our body and make our body submit to its will. And the Holy Spirit is sanctifying the rest of our soul and giving us the mind of Christ and the will and the, the desires and pushing us in a direction of wanting to be like Jesus in every other sphere and area of our life as well. And then we become made in the image of Jesus as this is taking place. So if you enjoyed this video, I would love to hear your thoughts. Leave them below. If you found this video helpful in any way, please feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so, I'd love it if you would subscribe. Be sure to check out the rest of the videos in this series. And if you haven't already, consider inviting a few friends to join into the full Bible study with you so that you can learn and grow together. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll come back again soon. Have yourself an empowered week.